there's this thread of um, seeking community, um, personal freedom, of um, self-acceptance, you know, there's these bigger human issues. From the river to the valley to the sea. Welcome to the Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast. I'm Dean Klinkenberg, and I've been exploring the deep history and rich culture of the people and places along America's greatest river, the Mississippi, since 2007. Join me as I go deep into the characters and places along the river, and occasionally wander into other stories from the Midwest and other rivers. Read the episode show notes and get more information on the Mississippi at MississippiValleyTraveler.com. Let's get going. Welcome to episode 16 of the Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast. I'm really excited uh, today to bring you the conversation I recently had with Gina Favano, who uh, hosted a podcast called Back Channel Radio that uh, spent six episodes going deep into the boathouse community around Winona's Latch Island. I think there's a, a lot of uh, mystery and romance maybe associated with the folks who live in those uh, boathouses. Uh, uh, it's a lifestyle that uh, conjures up images of uh, freedom and being off-grid, but there are some significant challenges associated with maintaining a lifestyle in a boathouse as well. So Jean and I, uh, we have a wide-ranging discussion about the boathouses from uh, what's the difference between a boathouse and a houseboat, to what the daily routine is like, the kind of work you have to do to maintain uh, a lifestyle in a boathouse, some of the big personalities uh, who have uh, lived in the boathouses over the years, the legal status, uh, how are folks able to uh, legally live in boathouses adjacent to public land, uh, and we also spend a little bit of time kind of looking at the future, wondering what uh, the boathouse community might look like down the road. Uh, I really hope that this will inspire you to go and listen to the full six-episode podcast, though, Back Channel Radio, hosted by Gina Favano. Check it out as soon as you get a chance. You won't regret it. It's a really interesting look at one slice of life along the Mississippi River. I've been fascinated with this community myself for a while, uh, so much so that I included a character in one of my mysteries in Letting Go in Lacrosse, who lived in a, uh, in a boathouse off of Winona's Latch Island. So, uh, and I, I'm looking forward to maybe one of these days having a cup of coffee with Gina or maybe uh, some other residents there and uh, getting a closer look myself at uh, the lifestyle on that, uh, uh, in that community. And once again, thanks to all of you who have shown some love through Patreon uh, or through Buy Me a Coffee. Your support keeps this podcast going and it makes me feel good. So thank you very much. And now let's get on to the interview. Gina Favano is a full-time visual artist and musician who has performed and shown her work in galleries, venues, and unconventional spaces throughout the U.S. and Europe. Originally from Philadelphia, she currently lives in a boathouse on the Mississippi River in Minnesota. In late 2022, she released the six-episode podcast, Back Channel Radio, about the history of the Latch Island boathouse community. She's working uh, on a book now based on her experiences archiving this history. Welcome to the podcast, Gina. Thanks. Glad to be here. Well, let's start off with the most basic of questions uh, and clear this up in people's minds. What is the difference between a boathouse and a houseboat? Um, I mean, a houseboat is just like a big boat with a little house kind of built into it. And a boathouse, the most accurate description would be a floating home. So it's it's not ambulatory. You can't just um, put a motor on it. They're, they're usually not... Um, any kind of like spherical shape that would want to like easily cut through water. Um, some of them are just, you know, four sided square little shacks um, or rectangular, um, you know, some semblance there about of that. So if I remember my history of this right, too, when these structures were kind of initially built, and we're going back to maybe the Depression or quite a ways back, they actually were built to house boats. Like, well, they right. were kind of floating garages, I think. And over time, they kind of evolved into spaces where people started hanging out 
and, and living in them a little bit more. Is that is that what you remember too? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was, you know, some evolution between that and um, shanty boats, which had a lot to do with the depression when, you know, people had to uh, travel a lot to find work and just kind of find somewhere to live on the fly, um, had no money to live in town. So they were able to build these structures that they could then um, move easily, kind of pull them to different locations. If they were told by the authorities they couldn't stay there or if it flooded or, you know, the next job was the next town down river, they could kind of pull their, their dwelling along. But, but you're right, technically a boathouse is, is like a garage that just kind of houses a boat. And they're actually, um, that's my dog, sorry. They're actually um, some uh, boathouse, I mean, I wouldn't call them communities, they're more like marinas that are nearby in parts of Minnesota and just across the river in Wisconsin that aren't, they're not, um, they're not zoned for habitable housing. They're like literally just boat houses to, to moor your boat. And then you have a place to come and take your boat out and you have easy river access. Well, right. So I, I know that uh, there are still some other like clusters of boat houses in places along the upper Mississippi, kind of, you know, not too far from Winona and La Crosse. There's a small community at Red Wing. There's another one at Brownsville, Minnesota, for example. Mm -hmm. But they're kind of slightly different places than the community that developed at Latch Island, as I understand it. Correct. Yeah, it's kind of um, an anomaly that we even got to be here. Um, to the best of our knowledge, Latch Island is the only year-round habitable boathouse community that's legally sanctioned anywhere on the Mississippi River, still in existence. Wow. So most of those other places, I guess, it's more weekend stuff or it's not a permanent residence for people in Brownsville or Red Wing and those other places, then it's kind of a, it's like a week, a, a cabin in the woods kind of thing rather than yeah. a place to live. Yeah. Yeah, correct. I think you need to, I'm not totally sure of the, the logistics, but um, uh, I think it has something to do with needing to have your permanent, your permanent address somewhere else. Hmm. And here, you, this can, th this is our permanent address on Latch Island. So how did this unique, I'm sorry, how did this oh. unique community get started in, in Winona then? Like how did folks, be, how did folks become, uh, how did this turn into a place where people were living uh, more permanently? Um, You know, there's no real easy answer to that. And I think that's part of why the history wasn't succinctly recorded anywhere. And also um, part of why it took, it took me so long to do all the, the, um, the deep dive of research that needed to happen to um, even begin to archive it. Um, there were people living on the island around the time of the Great Depression. And um, also prior to that, there were some hunting camps and things like that here. But none of that's been documented anywhere. Like a lot of that's hearsay, you know, some old timers who heard from someone who has now passed away that so-and-so maybe lived here or had a boathouse here at one point. Um, it doesn't really start to get documented anywhere until the 70s hmm. and or possibly the late 60s late 60s to early 70s um so there were some boat houses and like shanty boat type constructions here um what made it possible for them to kind of be here under the radar so long was that the island initially didn't start out being owned by the city of winona um it was owned by the chicago northwestern railroad and then uh, between 1976 and 1978, um, the city of Winona applied for a grant to the state of Minnesota um, to try to purchase the island from the railroad. And it took a couple years for the deal to get worked out and the money to change hands and everything. So then towards the end of 1978, um, when, it, when it looked like it was going to go through and the city was going to be able to purchase the island, um, everyone kind of realized that no clause had been written in as to like what if anything to do with the boathouses um because the at that point it wasn't being used very much by the railroad it was just kind of like a like a weird um blind spot in everyone's rearview mirror like no one was really using the island and there was no easy way to get to it um at, up until that point either because the the bigger bridge to access the island um was still being built around that time um, and that's, so that's when it became an issue. And by then, some of the people that were living here had been here for quite a while and had really started to, you know, 
foster this little community and they they were they cared about these homes that they had built for themselves and they were beginning to put like a lot of energy into it and you know all of their resources and stuff like that so then they that's when they first started to have like the early meetings about okay what do we do are we going to try to get organized are we going to try to figure out a way for this community to get to exist here in perpetuity um so then around 1981 that's when the first um kind of informal meetings of the Winona Boathouse Association began to happen um, just to have a way to interface with the city um, so they weren't just dealing with people on an individual basis but it was complicated because it was you know it was the Minnesota DNR was involved um, the Wisconsin DNR because it's so close to the border um, you know it was the city it was the state it was um, you know it was it was just a lot of different um, factions that uh, were interested in ousting the boathouses, but also didn't want to kind of didn't want to deal with like, um, you know, all of the dozens of people that were that were kind of starting to figure out how to like organize in this really grassroots way to protect their homes and their way of life. So, so there had been a boathouse community there when the railroad still owned the land. Or, yeah, I mean, but yeah, but it was informal and I have not been able to find documentation of it anywhere. Hmm. So, you know, it's possible that somewhere in Wisconsin, someone has some photographs in a shoebox under their bed. Um, if they do, we they can help email me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So when the land is being uh, transferred to ownership by the city of Winona, then what were some of the, uh, let's say, I'll call them institutional concerns about allowing the boathouse community to con to continue? Um, well, one of the the big and most substantial arguments was that the the park itself, the the park that Latch Island is connected to, is public land. So that was, you know, part of the idea behind the city purchasing the land was, oh, we're going to develop it into this great park blah, 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 it's gonna have paths, it's gonna have this and that. Um, and another element that they hadn't really thought through was that it floods twice a year. Hmm. Um, so there there really was and is no way to, to um, properly develop it into any kind of like usable, you know, structured um, public park with like, you know, making it accessible with like paved, paths and all of that stuff that's that's just never going to happen here it just floods too much and especially now with the way the climate is changing it's it's flooding even more and it's even more unpredictable um so so that was um you know their main their main sticking point right just as this was public land and they had grand ideas for the park yeah it's interesting to hear that now too because i've been to that uh latch island many times and it always, you know, it certainly feels undeveloped to this day. Like there's mm -hmm. a, an area with a small gravel or a dirt parking lot, a little bit of a beach that people will use when the weather's nice and the river's not too high. And then there's uh, what, Agamene Park? I never quite sure how to pronounce that word. But... Yeah, you got it. Yeah, Agamene is, is technically in Wisconsin. It's just across the bridge from here. Um, what's interesting about this area is that it, it's just, there's so much public land and all of that can be traced back to John Latch, who was uh, briefly the mayor of Winona, who was um, this eccentric man, he was a naturalist, and he had a ton of money and thought it was really important that people and animals have access to this land that remains undeveloped. So there's a ton of, um, I mean, huge swaths of land kind of all through the Driftless area that can be attributed to John Latch, but not Latch Island. Um, Latch Island, was actually named after John Latch because there used to be this really big bathhouse over on the main beach where uh, people could swim in kind of like a controlled, mostly so that children could swim in a controlled place and not drown because, you know, there were a lot of kids just drowning in town, being unsupervised swimming when it was hot out. Um, but that area, it gets used, I mean, all summer long, even all winter long, actually, it's really funny. There's a, there's, um, there's been this like 
well, it's it's a YouTube trend, but it's something that people have been doing for hundreds of years, which is just sitting in really freezing cold water. Yeah. Um, but all winter, all winter, there was this group of kids that would come and sit um, in this like giant square shaped hole. They had chainsawed through the ice and they would have like mittens and hats on, but just sit there. Um, but then in the summer, it's just like packed. It's like sometimes there'll be a hundred people on the beach. Um, wow. And that, and again, that part of the island doesn't flood nearly as much as this part. So, um, you know, it, it is, it is used a lot. Um, and that's great. There's picnic tables, there's, um, you know, a little trail and they, there's actually like a new bike path that's just across the bridge and, um, people love their outdoors activities in Minnesota. <laughs> Absolutely. And they, they love their water as well. They do. They really do. Um, well, let's go ahead and cover that piece of the story now then, because you were alluding to, you know, we started talking about how, you know, during the transfer of ownership, then there was a fight to uh, possibly evict people who were living in the boathouses here. So how did that play out? Um, obviously, there's still a boathouse community uh, on the island today. So there must have been some accommodation reached eventually to allow that legal status or yeah yeah and you know it happens over the course of um like 15 years um you know the the informal winona boathouse association was formed in 1981 which was a few years after the the island was acquired by the city of winona and then the the boathouse community didn't receive their first permit until 1996 which was also the same year that the Winona Boathouse Association first became incorporated, which means it's it's a nonprofit, um, and it still is. So, again, it's there was just a lot of um, all of these moments kind of spread out over the course of more than a decade of like, okay, so now the DNR um, has this issue with us, so we're going to work with them over the course of a couple of years and have a lot of meetings and. You know, in the boathouse community, it, it can't be understated that I think a big part of the reason they were allowed to remain was the amount of support they had from people living in the town of Winona. Because, you know, Winona, it's a, it's a small town, but it's kind of big for, for a small town. And there's like definitely um, like a counterculture presence in Winona. There were a lot of, um, uh, like rural communities, um, communes, that's what it's called. <laughs> there were a lot of communes kind of living just outside of town. Um, there were a lot of people who who had an appreciation for what the boathouse community was trying to accomplish um, for how they considered themselves to be such stewards of the river. Um, you know, how they, they had ecology first and foremost in their minds. Um, so I think that had a lot to do with it. Like when they would have these city council meetings and have these th different issues kind of arise one by one, whether it was like, you know, the dumpster in the park or what do we do about receiving mail, stuff like that. Um, you know, sometimes a hundred people would come to that meeting and show their support. Wow. That's great. Well, yeah. and as I think, you know, in the podcast, you go into a lot more detail over about this, this fight over 15 years, uh, uh, to be granted the legal right to stay. It, it is, um, we forget sometimes, I think, the number of agencies that have a hand in managing some aspect of the Mississippi, because this wasn't just the city of Winona. You mentioned the Minnesota DNR, the Department of Natural Resources. Mm -hmm. The Army Corps of Engineers was involved Correct. in this as yeah. well. All that It sounded like they kind of didn't really want to be involved in, in any of it. Uh, so uh, there's uh, there were a lot of different big institutions that were involved in um, basically determining the future of this small group of uh, this small community uh, living on the river. Right, right. Yeah, um, it's kind of amazing that it all got to, you know, pan out the way it did. <laughs> it's amazing that, they, that this small group of people, you know, uh, many of whom were just kind of living there because they wanted to be left alone, right. uh, ended up fighting these big institutions and eventually, you know, getting some legal recognition along the way. Um, something that I didn't really fully understand when I first got here, and again, I'm from the East Coast and I, I, I grew up in a city for most of my life. And this was just like, 
no one can, no one could actually even like give me the the full story either which was part of it i was like what so wait so why is this allowed to be here and then i would i would just hear like little bits and pieces like oh well, we had this court date in 78 and that's when it was legalized and then be like no no it was in 95 and that's when this happened um but anyway something something that i didn't fully appreciate at first until i really started to like lean into the history of the place was there was a historical precedence for living this way and that was that was part of you know the argument that the early boathousers were standing upon was that we have a right to live this way because in this part of the country there's there's a history of living this way it's a culture and this culture deserves to be um, protected and perpetuated and that was something I didn't fully get and then once I understood that I was like oh okay now I now I understand. Now I understand why, why it's important, you know? So was that something that would be, that was more of a tradition, like a cultural tradition, or is it something that had some legal framework supporting it to be going that far back? Do you, do you remember that part of it? You know, that's another um, kind of gray area in my research. It's, it's, it's pretty ambiguous and it, and it differs from county to county. And we're, again, we're so close to Wisconsin that, you know, like I can throw a rock and hit Wisconsin probably. Um, and the rules are totally different governing boathouses over there. So it was, I, I haven't gotten a clear answer as far as like, is there, was there a legal precedence for it? There was definitely a cultural precedence for it. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's a, there's a absolutely a long uh, history of people living on the river. You mentioned shanty boats, uh, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, that's a little different as you alluded because shanty boats were mobile at least, you know, if you didn't, your prospects weren't very good where you were you could always you know lift up anchor and, and float on down somewhere else whereas the boathouses are, are not going to float to another location uh, anytime without some assistance anyway I suppose mm -hmm, mm -hmm, correct so there is that long history it just seems like uh, in the 20th century maybe maybe even after World War II we did a lot to regulate people away from being able to live like that on the river except in this little area around Winona yeah, it was it was definitely perplexing to me when I first got here. Um, but then again, another thing that I really, as I started to um, read about it more and understand it more, another thing that really started to make sense to me was the, was just the way, I mean, not just in this area, but the entire length of the Mississippi has been um, changed by the lock and dam system which is governed by the army corps of engineers and like learning that that's purely based on commerce it has nothing to do with controlling the flooding um it, it just it just kind of like made me understand um where where that like the spirit of their fight kind of came from it was like oh yeah well who are they to completely you know rearrange all of the flora and fauna and like reintroduce these species that now we have to contend with and this and that and you know and now we we're having flooding because of these specific lock and dams that are that exist only to accommodate these large barges that are just moving commerce right um so it's interesting it, it's it's multifaceted you know right um but now that it's um you know that argument or none of these arguments actually come up very often because it, it was established so long ago that the boathouses are are just here and they're legal and they're protected um and that was part of why i wanted to document this was i wanted to hear these stories from these people while they were still around to tell their stories you know because it, it's only like in a generation or two they'll just be forgotten like how did these boathouses get to be here why why did these people think it was important to fight for that and to preserve them? Right, absolutely. And I want to get to more about uh, some of the characters and the day-to-day -day life in the boathouse, but I want to finish this up, uh, just like the status today then. Uh, so to live there, is there a permit that an individual has, that, like a, a residency permit of some kind? And mm -hmm. they're capped at a specific number as well at this point, right? Correct, yep. There's 101 spots and... Uh, mm -hmm there shall be no more um and we pay a mooring agreement to the city of winona 
And every five years, the, the boathouse lease gets reexamined. So it's not just, you know, it's never going to get looked at ever again. It's just, it gets looked at by the city and it just makes sure that it's still working for everyone. And the, the Winona Boathouse Association, the WBA is still um, very active for us and, you know, has meetings fairly often. And we just, you know, revisit all of the policies and make sure that it's still working well for everyone, including mm -hmm. the city. Right. And then you have a not for profit that sort of serves as your government in a sense that represents Correct. you to the city and other entities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, that's yep, cool. you got it. Um, well, let's let's talk a little bit about some of the nuts and bolts first of what it's like to live there. You've uh, you've lived in a boathouse for a while yourself now. Yeah. Um, well, we've been here full time since COVID started, but I've lived here part time. It'll be going on 10 years in September. So describe a little bit about what your boathouse is like. Um, my boathouse is a floating geodesic dome that was built in 1973 by um, people who thought it would be fun to try out carpentry um, for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> which always goes well. For the always, who which always, after. yeah. 50 years later, we're still we're still um, fixing a lot of early mistakes. Um, it's been, I would say only 20, 20 to 25 percent of it is still original at this point because it's it's sunk at least twice. Um, my husband acquired it before he and I got together. And um, something we talked a little bit about in the podcast is just how like how he was able to even resurrect it because it was it was sunken when he got it. Mm. Um, and, you know, he had to work on it a lot in the winter when you have you have the ice to kind of like, you know, push up against. So he had to like jack up the house and cut off the bottom and replace it. And um, it's a decent size. It floats on 100 blue plastic barrels. Um, and we have a long walkway that goes to shore. And, um, you know, all of that stuff just requires kind of constant maintenance. Because you're exposed to the elements, you've got the river around you. There's probably it's probably humid a lot because you're so close next to the water. Mm -hmm. um, and you have uh, are, do you? There are no utilities provided for the community, right? I mean, what, what's the utility situation for you? Um, well, we're on the lower portion of the island, which is known as if you look at a map, it's called Lower Latch, but it's also known colloquially as Wolf Spider Island, and there's there's, there's no utilities at all down here. The upper island has access to electricity. Um, so uh, we have solar panels and backup generators for when it's cloudy like today. Um, and we, um, you know, bring all of our water in and we have different water that we use for washing dishes and washing ourselves and um, drinking water is in a separate container. Um, the stove is propane and we burn wood to keep warm in the winter. So it's just, a, it's a lot of hauling, honestly. And um, I like winter, I like the snow, but um, I'm, I'm, you know, pulling all the wood inside and drying it out. It, it's starting to wear thin. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm ready for spring. Right, it sounds, it, to me, it just sounds like a lot of work. Like there's stuff you have to do every day that I can, you know, I take for granted, but you've got, you know, you've got to haul water in regularly and pay attention to how well the solar panels are picking up the sun and all things that I don't have to worry about. But yeah, yeah, it, it's not, it's not conducive to a lot of things. You know, it, it's, it's living like this gives me a lot of insight about why the people that lived here um, weren't the ones to archive the history because you, you kind of, you kind of can't, you know, you can't, it's, it's, it, it's like you're, your daily work becomes just doing all of the things that you need to live, uh, you know, and not freeze to death. <laughs> <laughs> I was going right. to say live well, but I, I changed it to just not, not freeze to death. <laughs> so you really have to want to live there. You have to want to live there. Yeah. Or it really doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It's like, you know, technically, especially compared to what's happening everywhere else in the country right now. Um, technically it's, it's a, the cost of living is low, but it, it's kind of not if you factor in 
you know, is what is my time worth? Because it's, it is constant. It's a lot of work. And Mm -hmm. that was another reason that I wanted to um, capture some of these stories was um, you get to a certain place and you kind of can't do it anymore. You know, and I, and I really was interested in talking to some of the older folks who were um, in the process of kind of having to transition, you know, off off the island and what that might be like for them. Right. I mean, there comes a point where you're, physically it's probably very hard to keep up with all that as as you get older. Oh, you, yeah. And in the podcast, you do uh, go in depth with a couple of people in particular who, as they got older, some of the challenges they ran into staying Uh, and the choices they had to make. Um, I don't want to like just uh, like belabor the negative aspects of this, but obviously there are benefits, joys that come from living there as well. Like um, you get to experience the river, for example, in a very different way than the rest of us do. Can you tell me a little bit about what that's like? Um, Well, I'm looking out the window right now and I'm I'm watching the water. I'm seeing the, the trees reflecting on the water. Um, seeing some birds fly by. Um, I see an eagle off in the distance. Um, there are these little moments. There are these like little moments of, um, it, it kind of feels like, you know, your eyeballs are being massaged by the scenery a little bit. Um, it's definitely easier living in the summer. You kind of feel like, oh, wow, I just, I have it made. How did I get to be so lucky? And then winter comes and it's a you know you you have you work for it it feels like you kind of you get to you appreciate the easier moments because you have kind of like worked to be there and to get to witness them um yeah yeah I mean it's it's beautiful there's no there's no two ways about it but it I do appreciate having the chance to talk about the more arduous aspects of living here because that's something that um you know when we get visited all summer long by like youtube camera crews and photographers and whoever you know feels the need to come and document it but they're they don't document it properly i'd say 99 percent of them they everyone has the tendency to kind of romanticize it um and there is i mean it's just abundant non-stop beauty here no matter what the season is but there i find that there's always kind of like an undercurrent of, um, you know, you have to be kind of hyper aware of, you know, my, my anchors set properly, what's happening with the river, you know, but then there, there are days where it's just peaceful and nice and you don't have to think about that kind of thing. Right. There are still legitimate risks there as well. I, you know, if a big storm blows through, you know, you've got to make sure everything's tied up properly or, mm-hmm. um, you're you know you could suffer damage on the river you don't really want to be stranded in the middle of the river in the middle of a big thunderstorm i think the people that lived here for for all those years um i think they thrived off the excitement honestly i think they that was like part of what they loved um they they all of them kind of had this like affinity for weather like oh we got a big storm coming or oh this or that or oh you see that tree and it was like I'm like wow you're really excited <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like <laughs> seeping through your pores this is like this is making you feel alive in a way you know right well as I recall from you know, I lived in Minnesota for a few years when I was younger and uh it seemed like the weather was one of the most uh favored topics of conversation anyway um uh so oh, man, I, imagine, I do it like, now yeah <laughs> Now, if you lived in a community like uh, that Latch Island Boat community. uh... Yeah, yeah. What's really interesting, too, that that I really wanted to spend some time documenting was um, most of those people that, you know, founded the community and were here in the early days, this is before um, weather apps. No one had a cell phone and no one had television. You couldn't just watch the weather on TV and kind of get a get a feel for what might be happening in the next couple days um and um that's something that that uh my neighbor john rupke and i talk about a little bit in one of the later episodes of the podcast is he would he would measure the ice every day and he also kept this extensive log of what was happening with the weather so that he could then 
you know, try to predict what might be happening in like the same time of year, the following year. But then in the last few years, that all kind of, you know, went out the window with um, the weather being so unpredictable, which is also still really interesting to, to look back at records of it and just see the big jumps in, in changes that were happening. Right. Well, and I imagine living in the boathouse there, too, you're probably more attuned to the changes that have been happening in the last few years. Um, you know, you're more attuned to when the, the ice, well, as you, we were talking before uh, we started recording, you know, part of the, one of the advantages of winter is the ice gets thick enough, you could drive out there to bring construction materials and work on the boathouse. Uh, and this year, the ice never got thick enough to do that. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, the first time that's happened in um, everyone that I've spoken with in, in their memories. Um, I'm sure it's happened, you know, once or twice in the in the past, but it was it was definitely it would have been an anomaly then. Mm -hmm. Which would be you know, if that's going to end up being more the norm, that's going to really make you know, it's going to add another degree of difficulty to life in the boathouse community, I, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, again, it goes back to like my um original impetus to to um record it and to archive it because the the future is uncertain for for these reasons you know hey dean klinkenberg here interrupting myself just wanted to remind you that if you'd like to know more about the mississippi river check out my books i write the mississippi valley traveler guidebooks for people who want to get to know the river better I also write the Frank Dodge Mystery Series set in, set in places along the Mississippi. Read those books to find out how many different ways my protagonist, Frank Dodge, can get into trouble. My newest book, Mississippi River Mayhem, details some of the disasters and tragedies that happened along Old Man River. Find any of them wherever books are sold. So uh, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about some a couple of the characters. Um, some of the old timers are... Uh, that you highlight during the podcast. Uh, tell me about a, a couple of people who really stood out to you. Well, the main one's John, um, who got to be a, you know, by the time by the time it was all said and done, he he was he had become a really important person in my life. He was um, he was my buddy. You know, we'd hang out and play chess. And what's interesting about John is he didn't have a big personality, but he had a big story you know, um, that was just like um, fascinating to me to, to like move to this, this kind of isolated rural community. And, um, you know, he, he, he moved here um, when he was in his early forties. Um, he was a, he was a graduate dean at a local university and um, had been living, living as a, a closeted person for his entire life. Um, you know, he was born in the 30s, so it wasn't an era where people could easily just come out and be themselves. Um, and his his leaving his position, and he, he was public about it, he wrote a letter, I'm leaving, this is why, coincided with um, his building this new community for himself on the island. And that was really fascinating to me, just like where those two histories kind of overlapped um yeah and it just made me want to get to know him better and hear more about his story and um something that he was also known for locally was um he he was this really outspoken activist for for gay rights and human rights in general and he would write letters to the all the local newspapers and um I tried to count them after he passed away and I lost track over after I counted over 200 and then I just kind of lost track. I was like, okay, there's a lot. He's been doing it for a long time. There's a lot. Um, but all of his letters were, were generated out of his little boathouse. I mean, I would boat by his place at night and I would just see him in there with like one little light sitting at his desk. And it was just, oh, it was just such a good feeling. And I knew he was in there like making drafts of his next letter and he would type it on his typewriter and then go into town, print it out at the library, and then hand deliver it to the, the newspaper offices, which was <laughs> just, and he did that for over 40 years. Wow. And Yeah, I know. And I was like, no one is documenting this. This feels so important to the, not just to the island, but to the whole town, to have that voice that's been so consistent 
Um, yeah, so John was John was uh, an important one for me personally. I we sat down and I interviewed him 22 times. So it was an interesting way to get close to someone, which is through asking them questions about about their life. Um, I do understand what you mean by the he had a big story too. Though I, I, one of the arcs that jumped out at me listening to his story was just. Uh, it it seemed like somebody who maybe for almost the first half of his adult life felt like an outsider. And then when he landed at Latch Island, he finally found a place where he felt like he belonged. Exactly. Exactly. And it was, you know, there were all these little elements kind of like peppered throughout the community um, that that made it even more compelling for me personally to like want to archive it. It's like this is this is important, you know, like, let's say, you know, 20 years from now, a big flood comes, washes it all away. It, it's important for people to know that, that these people were here mm -hmm. and did this in this like specific part of the Mississippi river, you know? Right. Well, and he's not the only one with a, uh, an interesting story too. Tell me a little bit about uh, Tyra Falk. Oh yeah. Um, Tira. Yeah. Tira. All right. Um, um, Tira. I, I didn't actually get to interview her the way I had John. She was, she was really reticent and, and, um, you know, I don't think she would have been comfortable being in that position of, of being recorded and asked a lot of questions. Um, and so she, she had actually, she had passed away the year before the, the podcast was released. Um, but I did, I was able to find um, interviews with her. So we were, we were able to include um, her voice and her answering some questions in the seventies and eighties of um, local news crews that came down to the island to interview some of the people living here. Um, she was amazing. She, she grew up in Duluth and um, she came from a long line of Norwegian boat builders and she was the lone woman and her family that took up that tradition and she actually built two of the boathouses that are down they're still standing they're like two of the most well constructed ones that are here on the lower part of the island well, they're not standing they're floating right yeah sorry <laughs> sorry <laughs> um yeah i mean she she was just like another example of like you know the, the the thing that that a lot of these people have in common is they're all like really tough really independent um and also just sensitive in this really specific way that you know it, it made sense for them to live here and be like kind of alone but also have community and um you know also be willing to entertain interviews from time to time so they'll have like this like kind of like this flamboyant streak that maybe only comes out once a year or every couple of years. Um, yeah, she was special. And if, if I remember, right, didn't she do like a, a long boat trip down the Mississippi at one point in her life? Or uh... she did. She built. She built a boat, um, a, a kind of a large houseboat, and she did. She boated down to New Orleans. Um, uh, so did my husband, actually, in a little plywood boat that he built made the trip from Minneapolis to New Orleans. Um, so, well, it's interesting that I would bring him up because it it kind of speaks to the, the commonality between us being like the next generation of people who live on the island and this older generation who are now like passing on. Um, you, I mean, normal people don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a special kind of, of like, weirdo who is really um into the 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 element of struggle that it just demands of you there's no way around it you can't boat from here to new orleans in a small handmade boat and um not get into a few dicey situations you know right just like you can't live in a, a floating house uh on the mississippi and not have to deal <laughs> with uh, those struggles too so uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah very true <laughs> so is that uh, it's an interesting I, I hadn't thought too deeply about that but is this kind of one of the uh, common threads among the people who live in the community that 
obviously you have to have the toughness, as you said, and you've got to have some pretty good skills, you know, some you know, good you know, life skills and survival skills. But there's also that sort of adventurous spirit. Like, you know, a lot of the, the, the people that you highlighted still have these stories about things they had done in their lives that were, let's say, bigger than what a lot of us would would consider doing. Definitely. Uh, so yeah. they didn't just live a quiet life in a boathouse. Uh, they had all these other aspects of their lives uh, as well. Right, right. And the thing about these older folks was, um, you know, they they weren't living in the digital age. They didn't really have the the tools to um, preserve these stories in a way where they where they would be like accessible and um, you know not just not just decay because they were typed on paper. Um, so that was you know that just that time was of the essence. That felt really important to me to to um, devote devote some of my time to preserving those. Um, Another interesting thing was that a lot of a lot of those people that you mentioned, not Tira, because she was um, she grew up around boats and was had been handy her whole life and was just a master woodworker. Um, but by and large, most of them, this was a new experience for them. So they like they get to kind of jumped in feet first and learned by doing, hmm. which also like speaks to a lot of the ethos of the place, which if you just kind of like go for it, you know you see something that you want to do and um, don't let ignorance <laughs> stand in your way <laughs> and ineptitude. <laughs> right. So it also takes either a uh, uh, good self-confidence in your ability to do those things, or maybe some naivete. About oh, that's, I mean, you just described youth in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Are are any other uh, big characters that uh, you want to mention? Um, I would like to mention, I had to actually omit some of the bigger characters when I was making the podcast because, you know, for ethical reasons. Um, And and this kind of speaks to like being a member of the community and, and like the amount of care that myself and um, the producer, Suzanne Hogan, really put into um, how we, why the stories that we chose to share, the ones that we left out, how, like how we showcase the ones that we did share. Um, Like one of the bigger personalities down here has um, pretty advanced dementia. He doesn't live here anymore. He's actually living in like a very nice facility. Um, But he was a close friend who we helped out quite a bit his last few years on the island but you know he couldn't he couldn't really give informed consent um and i i was like okay there's no ethical way for me to include any interviews with him um i'm hopeful that one day i can figure out a way to record his story in a way that feels appropriate and respectful Mm -hmm. um but there were a lot of moments like that like and there's another another person in particular i'm thinking of who's Oh man, he would have been radio gold, <laughs> but he wasn't comfortable. He would, he, you know, he wasn't comfortable having his story, his story shared publicly at, at, on, on any level. And you have to respect that, you know? Yeah. Um, so this is just like a little, just a little slice into some of the stories and some of the people that were here. Mm-hmm. And we tried to, we tried to present like, um, a balanced view from more than one position. So it really, you know, we tried our best to give, to kind of give the full picture, even if we couldn't tell all of the stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you did a great job with that too. Like some Thank of the you. characters are complicated people, like all of us are. And, uh, you know, it doesn't do justice to that by just telling, you know, the idealized or romanticized version of somebody. So exactly, I think yeah. you covered that all very well. Yeah, Thank one you. thing I was just thinking about too, is that, uh, as you were talking, is that uh, it, it's interesting to me. Like in, in some ways, like one of the attractions of living there is, you know, maybe to be a little bit reclusive to have the space to yourself. But it's also an area where that line between public and private is much thinner than it is in a lot of other places. So yeah. could you talk a little bit about that? 
yeah, I mean, we're, we're, you know, we're moored to public lands um, and floating on public waterways, you know, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. It is, it is a public space. Um, so it's, you have to be okay with that, you know, and um, not only accept that, but kind of welcome it uh, in, on some level, you know, as long as people are respectful. Um, right, because you have like people this, floating by you in boats all the yeah, time. Yeah, and they're mm -hmm. and they're curious, you know, rightfully so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I know when I've been when I visited the island, yeah, you know, I, I uh, I've been very careful about keeping distance from the boathouses because those are where people live. So, uh, what would you suggest as an etiquette for people who are visiting and curious about it? Just look from a distance take pictures from the bridges I ha what what how do you how do you wish people would would handle that I think I think um well I'm going to start with saying no wakes please that's the, that's the big one that's actually can be dangerous and you know we've had cups fall off the shelf and just that's annoying um it's like any other neighborhood you know you wouldn't go past the sidewalk and look in someone's window but you're also welcome to walk down the sidewalk. You know, that, that's that's a public space. Mm -hmm. um, I think just common sense. <laughs> <laughs> the answer to so many things, just common sense. I know, sense. I know. It, you, you wouldn't think it would be like that hard to come by, but. Right. Yeah. No wakes, please. Please don't look in my window. <laughs> right. Don't walk, yeah. don't walk up, up my walkway to my house. Yeah. 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 Um, so what's the um, what's the future look like for this community? I think a lot of people in the city of Winona and beyond value the boathouses because they're uh, well, they're pretty. They add a lot to um, you know they're kind of a tourist attraction. Um, so even if you know people don't know the backstory or think it's like that important to preserve um i think they still see its value in other ways so i think they're secure for the time being um but you know we'll see what happens as the planet continues to heat up um it might it might look a little different in the next 10 15 years um there definitely aren't as many people living here full time as there used to be and so it's changed. It's not that, if, you know, if you walk down to the island and walk past the boathouses, the counterculture that was so vibrant in the 70s and 80s isn't, isn't as present as it once was, which is, um, again, part of why I wanted to record those stories, just have a record of it somewhere. Um, so it feels a lot different. It's, it's, you know, they're going for more money and that dictates who gets to use them and it's usually just people who maybe come down once a month with their kids or you know um it's definitely changing i think the boathouses will continue to be here in some capacity i'm not like you know outwardly concerned with that happening anytime soon but i think how they get used and who's using them will continue to change mm -hmm. in the next few years so of the hundred or so uh, boathouses in, in that community, do you have a ballpark guess as to how many how many of them are occupied year round? Um, less than twenty. Yeah. Yeah, and that and that fluctuates. And that's different than it would have been twenty or thirty years ago. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um. So it, it seems like it. You know. Well, one of the inevitable things, like you've got a limited resource, right? You've got a hundred or so of these permits, so yeah, you can't have new ones. So when some the demand probably uh, is still going up, people would love to be able to at least go there on a weekend. So people who can afford to buy those permits when a rare one comes open, a different demographic than who uh, initially lived there. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's just like kind of reflecting what's happening with the housing market everywhere, you know, which is interesting because it's always been kind of like, you know, it's a, it's a little community and it has all the kinds of like joys and issues that any other community would have on land. It's just, we're human beings and we like to um, replicate that wherever we go. <laughs> yes. So it's, yeah, it's definitely 
you know, it's, things are tough all over, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> right. <laughs> so have you, is there any talk that there might be other places along the river that might allow boathouse communities to reemerge or? Not that I've heard, no, uh-uh, which is, um, you know, what makes this place so special. Mm-hmm. Well, well, it is. Yeah, it is. A, it, it's interesting to me in so many levels, like the collection of people, amazing people with big stories. Like you said, it's a, a little taste of river life. That's a throwback. You know, we used to have more communities like this of people living on the river uh, mm -hmm. that and they're much harder to find now. Just there's so many great stories. I, I really hope people will listen to the full uh, six episodes of the podcast. It's very well done. Great stories. Uh, you'll learn a lot more about this. So tell us where people can find the podcast and tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. It's at backchannelradio.org. And um, if you just follow the link, you can go to uh, Apple or Spotify, um, kind of wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes uh, to that as well. Uh, do you, what's going on for you? Do you have some work uh, that you'd like to let folks know about or that uh, where, where people can keep up with what you're working on next? Well, we're, we're discussing the possibility of doing a season two of back channel radio. Um, and you know, there, it, we could spend the next five years just putting out seasons that are only about Latch Island. Um, that's probably not what we're going to do. Um, what's nice about the, the title and kind of the mission statement of the podcast is that it's, it can be kind of an umbrella for these like under told, under recorded stories that are kind of everywhere. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. It's um, it's grant writing season for me. So I'm just in the process of securing funding to keep the website active and all that good stuff. Um, and I'm also in the early stages of compiling the archives into a book form. So maybe if you interview me three years from now, I'll be able to re report on that. <laughs> you have just a, a few materials to work with for that. <laughs> there is so, oh my goodness. There's so much. There's so much. Yeah. Thousands, thousands of documents. And as you said, though, like it's so important to, to do that. Especially you appreciate it more knowing how few resources you had access to pre-1970 or so. Now you have a wealth of material to work with, at least to document a little later time period. but you know, those could go away too. So. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're literally crumbling. Um, and a lot of them have gotten wet over the years. Um, so they're all, they're all digitized. That's actually where this whole um, journey of archiving started was just um, digitizing them for the local County historical society. But the more I got into the information and the more I interviewed John, the more I saw like a, there's this thread that runs through all of the stories that you don't you don't have to know anything about boats or rivers to to relate to. There's this like there's this thread of um, seeking community, um, personal freedom, of um, self acceptance. You know, there's these bigger human issues, mm -hmm. um, which is a big part of why we decided to go ahead and turn it into a podcast because there is there's more there than just you know maybe like a river aficionados or boating aficionados could could relate to well great well let's uh let's call it a wrap at that then so thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today and uh, for, for you. your brilliant podcast and uh let's stay in touch yeah thanks so much this was great And now it's time for the Mississippi Minute. Well, I just had a nice discussion with Gina Favano about the boathouse community, uh, what known as Latch Island. I wanted to recommend another resource for you. There are other boathouse communities along the Upper Mississippi River besides at Latch Island. You know, Latch Island, the folk, the, that community is different because it has more full-time residents than the other places. In fact, you know, you generally won't find full-time residents at these other boathouse communities. But there are other clusters of these along the upper Mississippi. You'll see uh, you'll see a few boathouses at places like Red Wing, Minnesota, uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin, 
and uh, Brownsville, Minnesota. Those are the most visible uh, boathouse communities, I think. I want to recommend, though, if you want to continue to go a little deeper into what that world is like, there's a book called The Floating Boathouses on the Upper Mississippi, Their History, Their Stories, by Martha Green Phillips. It's a really uh, delightful little book that uh, goes deep into the history of boathouse communities, tracing their roots from uh, the early days when uh, people lived on shanty boats and were living off the river in, in wooden craft, uh, living off the river through hunting and fishing and foraging and other means. Generally people uh, of very modest means uh, who are living a subsistence existence uh, from these uh, shanty boats. Uh, that's really the roots of uh, the boathouses of today. Uh, and she does a nice job of tracing the history from, from those very modest uh, beginnings to what the, the communities are like today. A highly recommended book, beautiful photography, some very fascinating stories as well. So once again, that's The Floating Boathouses on the Upper Mississippi by Martha Green Phillips. Thanks for listening. I offer the podcast for free, but when you support the show with a few bucks through Patreon, you help keep the program going. Just go to patreon.com slash Dean Klinkenberg. I'd be grateful if you'd leave a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast app. Each review makes a difference and helps other fans of the Mississippi River and the Midwest find this show. The Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast is written and produced by me, Dean Klinkenberg. Original music by No Offense. See you next time. Mm-hmm.